Recently I was in Cape Town uh, working on the Pirate Performance Academy. Um, it's an academy where we actually get coaches from all over the country to, to come through to one central point and talk to some of South Africa's leading, um, leading coaches or um, leaders in the sports field about very aspects of sports. Now the coaches we get from around the country are school coaches so we try and aim and try and help them power through from um, taking the, the, the kids from a very young age and preparing them for what, what there is out there in the future. Um, specifically within the sporting field, but a lot of the lessons that can be learned from the Pirate Academies actually apply through to um, life lessons in general. So uh, this is actually quite a long clip because I've actually I've done interviews with um, three of the four coaches. Unfortunately, I left out uh, Coach David, who speaks about the mind part of the game. I didn't get a video clip on him. I've got an audio clip only. But um, the three other coaches have got actually a lot, a lot to say. So the first coach we're starting off with is Benny McCarthy. Benny McCarthy now, he, well he was one of South Africa's top footballers. He played for Bafana Bafana for many, many years. He's gone on, he's played, in, um, he's played overseas, he's got a, a huge history of playing in the, in the Premiership. And he's done exceptionally well and he's very highly respected overseas. But now he's come back to South Africa, played a little bit more in South Africa and he's gone on to become a coach at Cape Town City. So Benny is talking about how to prepare kids for uh, the step from school to be ready to actually come into a club system, uh, what he's expecting from his players in the club system and how since he's become a, a club coach and he's taken over from a previous coach, how he's come through in a clean slate and um, actually seen players for who they are and not from their reputations before them. So it's actually quite interesting to talk to Benny and I, I hope you enjoy his clip. Um, yeah, today I think was a fantastic act, um, activation, you know, from Powerade, um, about the academy, about the schools, performances and sharing ideas and I think a lot of good came, came from it because as much as I was speaking and conveying, talking about um, team goals and team philosophy and style of play and um, leadership skills and how do you how do you deal with, with problem players or how do you deal with with superstars and normal players and bringing them on the same levels and 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 and, and get them to understand that we all here for the same goals and 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 how we got to work together and that's how i think it was it was amazing you know just hearing some of the questions that was coming from from the from the from the coaches um i think it's a lot of valuable um, questioning for me you know so to take from this because things that I didn't know about myself I got to find out here in this seminar so, so I think it, 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 it's been so great and so helpful and, and refreshing and hearing other aspects that was talked about the, the, about the mindset coach and how important the roles does every little thing plays, you know, and how good administration works, and how you gotta use admin to also work on this on the, the the team's goals and and the support systems and 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 going into to to the locals and helping develop spotting talent and you know finding them on the grassroots and how we can make a difference and how we can change things so yeah i know a lot of the coaches have a tough task on their hands but we're a big family you know we're a big family and we got to bounce off each other we got to use our experiences that we've that we've learned and that we've heard in this seminar today and use that and take back and then hopefully that can a little bit as long as you take one thing that you've learned from today, it's, it's better than what you came in with, you know. So, so it was good and, and I was privileged to be part of, of this whole setup today. Yeah, listen, I think, I think if you're honest and, and, and I think, like I said, it's, it's so important that we as coaches are an example. Like, honesty must start with us, you know, because sometimes players do have, tend to shy away from being open and honest with you so they would tell you no that I'm not injured but he's carrying an injury but just so he can play because coaches are coaches have to be honest and I think you have to give everybody a fair platform everyone must start on the same irrespective of what you've done prior to this um, 
the situation that you're in. But if coaches, if coaches can do that, then I see coaches will see more players start blossoming, blossoming under their leadership and their guidance because now you're telling them that they as equal as as the superstar that we had last season. So now he comes back, yeah, he's, he's done amazingly last season, but last season is forgotten now. Now you've got to move on to this season, and this season, everybody starts at zero again. And then you got away, you got to work your way to 100, and when you get there quicker, that's when you that's when you excel. And you know, you're not, you're not, you're not judged based on your past performance, you judge on what you do every single day. And I think that's what what coaches have to try and implement because with players, because I think as, as much as players, some of them are naive in the situation, but they prefer honesty. And when you are honest with them, you see it actually helps a lot. So I hope that coaches can become more honest with players than 100% and that's how you manage, that's how you manage some um, players with big egos if you feed them, you know how to manage them. Um, as long as their goals is exactly the same as your goals, then you don't have a problem and when you need to put your arm around the shoulder, then that's what it takes and that's what it takes, you know, but the discipline must be, he must respect the team rules, he must respect what goals that we've set for the team. If, the individual goals, players can work on that themselves, but it must be within the regulations of what goals that we set ourselves as a team. So, so that's how I think coaches should should treat and handle the the so-called superstars that they have in the team. You know, no, it's not. I won't say it's an excuse. It's 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 it's, it's just restrict you from doing what you actually want to do because you want to set yourself there's maybe different elements of 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 of, of trainings that you want to feed that you want to attack you know or that you want to improve but because you're limited for time and, and the, the, this time the space is so short and now you gotta just try and focus on one one thing but might not be a not be a bad thing when you have them for that little of time because at least now you can be focused only on one specific goal and you can perfect that and then once the players have learned and they know the, the, the movement and whatever it is that you've trained in they perfected that and then you can move on to the next and to the next and then before you know it, you've got a you've got a full function team that that perfected so many different technique elements of training sessions and that because you emphasize you 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 were able to to spend those two hours that you have them for that for that week period you focus only on one thing whereas whereas for us when you get to this level unfortunately we can't just focus on one specific element you got to touch on on many different things and i think that's why we get the players for more than just two hours a day we get them for every single day up until we decided okay then we need a break from them then you give them a day off or two days off but other than that I have them five days a week and in that five days today I'm touching today I'm only focusing on perfecting our technical ability to pass a ball then we do for the two hours that I have them for that session we work on that tomorrow we change we change our subject and then we focus on something else and then on three days later i can always revisit my first day and see how well they've taken how well they've taken in and then we revisit our first day's training sessions and then we then we put it to the test to see now how well they've come on so i've got that kind of time frame that schedule you know but Whereas I can't just focus on one specific thing. So I think coaches have to just try and do the best that they can with the situation that they're in. The limited time that they have with the players to try and just maybe focus on, on what, they, what they're good at and then perfecting that. The second coach that we're talking to is Paul Dalport. 
Now, Paul Dalport is a legend in the South African Rugby Sevens uh, scene. He's been one of the assistant coaches, he's been a player first in the South African Sevens side, he's been an assistant coach to various coaches in the actual South African and the, and the Springbok Sevens team. And then he's, um, now he's moved on to actually become the coach of the women's Sevens side. So Paul talks about talent identification because they, they, there's, they, there are certain things within talent identification that, that are quite interesting. Firstly, there's um, a player who's been very well coached compared to a player who's got a natural ability. Now, which player do you choose? How do you choose them? How do you get the most out of those players? Um, he also goes through, on his actual presentation, he goes through certain criteria that he's looking for in certain positions. But for every one of these criteria where he says this person must be in such a way, He's got another um, slide where he actually shows an example of something that actually breaks that rule. So it's actually quite fascinating listening to him and he's, he talks about how coaches at school level can actually identify talent and how to bring out the most in a player. Uh, I, just, I just touched on a bit of talent identification, um, kind of the holistic approach, how we, how we do it. And then I just, I just took the delegates through our scouting manual. Um, that Neil and Morris put together quite a few years ago and that we've kind of updated every year. Um, thought it was a good idea. Uh, it doesn't matter what sport you come from, just to have that framework. You know, it doesn't matter if you, you know, come from netball or hockey, you can kind of tailor it to, to your needs and then, and then just kind of work from there. Absolutely. Um, and then again, you, you, you take a lot of things into account. I think for, for the coaches, they can decide how they want to play, you know, what, what brand, what style of, 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 of whatever, rugby or cricket or netball they, they'd like to play. And then again as well, just looking at things like your talent pool, what, what do you have to work with? Um, and just setting, setting, setting realistic goals regarding your talent ID and, 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 and that. Yeah, it's tough. I think um, for us, in, in in terms of rugby, you look you you look quite uh, quite intensively at the soft skills. So you can see when someone's been coached well. You know, if they they in their, their accuracy in, in passes, maybe their pre work on, on on attack, their movement on defense, just their their, their, their general awareness. Um, so those those are things that 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 uh, that we look at. And again, it's 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 much easier for me because I'm. Um, I'm, I'm looking at talent for the national academy, so I'm always looking at the at the national players. So it's Grand Como week, it's Craven week, you know, it's our under 17 Craven week seven. So for us, it's you know we, we are looking for that caliber of player, and those are those are the things that are quite set in stone for us in terms of what we're looking for. Definitely, I think I mean just 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 having a look at um, at, at at the at the at the basic stats. You know, we just we just wanted to come up with a with a framework, and I think the sometimes the danger with having a scouting manual is you stick to it too rigidly, um, and that that's kind of just what I wanted, what the message I wanted to get across is that it's it's great to have a framework to have a reference point to go back to just to make your job a bit easier, um, but there, there are those special talents that that maybe don't fall into those parameters that still need to be given an an, an opportunity. Gee, I really. I really enjoyed it. I, I said from the beginning, I, I, I really wanted to make it quite, quite, quite interactive. Um, and I think they have, they have a lot of the questions and, and, and kind of problems that, that us at the national, you know, and, and the professional level to deal with. Um, they were talking about, you know, what about the, what about the players that, uh, you know, don't come from the affluent schools or the, or the schools that are, that are, you know, playing on a high level and given opportunities. Do we? Do we pick them up? Um, and that's that's quite a tough one. I think there'll 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 always be plenty of players that are that are falling through the cracks, and that's up to us to try and to try and fix, just to try and create more opportunities for those kids to try and level the playing field a bit. Um, and, and and I think that's definitely something that we're going to put a lot of effort into. Okay, Gee, it was, it was uh, absolutely incredible. I mean, I've, I've uh, always been a uh, Benny McCarthy fan, um, and I think Benny said it as well. It was great to see it in his presentation. I think all of us are, are fans, you know before we were players and before we've become coaches. Um, it was just great to hear his chat about his experiences and what he's learned from, from, from uh, his coaches that coached him and uh, kind of his coaching philosophy and what he's going to take forward. And then David Becker was just a complete breath of fresh air. Um, it was just, just incredible, a different, different take on things, you know, the conscious and the subconscious mind and kind of how you how you chat to people to get the best out of them. Um, I think I think it was it was fantastic. And then um, Suzanne as well, just from the from the from the Paralympic sphere, and also for me from a from a team sport perspective, hearing how how someone does it differently um, in the in the individual sport of athletics, I think is just so much to learn. Um, and that's that's the fantastic thing about being part of uh, events like today is um, you always want to learn, um, you always want to improve, we're all so, so introspective and we just want to get better and, and I think 
provide more opportunities for the, for, for the people that we coach. The final person that we that is talking is actually Suzanne Ferreira. Now Suzanne Ferreira is, is slightly different from the other coaches just in the sense that um, she has coached athletes in three Paralympic Games. So currently Suzanne is part of uh, Sasko's High Performance Commission. So she talks about high performance coaching with the kids, how to get the most out of players, how to, the differences between um, different players and how to maximize and look for whatever suits the one player compared to whatever suits another, whatever's special in one player compared to whatever's special in another player. Um, she talks about specific challenges with para-athletes, um, the change in technology and how technology has improved the times and the d distances and the, the various aspects within Paralympics. But the same kind of technology or, sim or similar technology has been applied to um, able-bodied athletes and how that's changed their times. Um, and then she, refer she takes this and talks, because she's talking from like an adult perspective or, or a um, higher age group, and she applies that directly through to what happens in schools, um, for your general schools and your general athletes and how to create a high performance environment in the school. I spoke about coaching effectiveness and I think it's um, import important for a coach to really think about what his job is about and at the end of the day we, ha we heard also this morning from David that it's important to know what the expectation is from, from a point of view and I think a lot of the time we as coaches we just go through the job of being the technical or the tactical or the physical type of coach um, but in order to bring all, the, all of those together there's a lot of things that um, you need to work towards and um, research shows that it's your interpersonal skills, your intrapersonal skills and then, then your sport specific knowledge that you need to apply and develop the four C's, like I said, for, for athletes. Um, so I think that was that is what I tried to bring across today, um, but also challenge a little bit the mindset um, of where you're coming from and what is your mind about coaching and what do you want to achieve. It's competence, character, connection, and communication. Yeah, your competence is your, your basic competencies that you have um, as, a, as a player or as an athlete or let's call it your physical and your tactical skills um, which link to your, the whole body f um, and, the, and the mind from that. Um, the characters, building character through sport is your life skills that you actually develop um, from that. Connection is your relationships. Um, how do you relate to someone? Um, are you looking after your teammates? Are you responsible to, to your, of responsive to your coach? Are you looking after yourself in development? And the communication is, is really about, are, are we clear? And where we want to go from that. I've got this bit hate about, it's all about winning or winning at all costs. And I think um, we believe that if you do not focus on the winning, you're not going to be able to win. So my heart is really, I, I have a strong belief that if you focus on developing the person, that person will bring the results as well at the end of the day. So um, it all started by me standing next to a field or a track and the athletes are so disappointed and not reaching their goals in that sort of sense. And I like, I care about you as a person. Why are you so um, disappointed in, in this whole, you had 99% of the training session was everything well done. But the one thing you didn't get, you wanted to run a two seconds on the 10 meters and you ran a 201 and now you're disappointed. And it, it made me think a lot of, of where we're going from that. So to change that mindset and, and really focus on developing the person and creating that character in that. And yeah, I, I, it, it was sort of a nerve nervous period in my, in my life, is that going to end up bringing the results as well? And we went to Rio in 2016 and the results was, was as good as before, bringing together with that a real sense of, of fulfillment, like David said as well um, during this day. So if you just focus on the performance outcome, you miss sometimes that fulfillment. The fulfillment means a lot more than, than the performance outcome. Yeah, so it is absolutely right in the beginning, the main focus of, of the Paralympic Games, like in 1948 and when it all started, was the rehabilitation focus. It's people that were injured and they created new sport as a social medium of, of bringing them back into society. And as media has actually got more involved in, this, in the sport, it was more broadcast and, and I think the two played a part in actually uplifting and giving athletes and players opportunity to develop themselves to to greater capacity to the full potential and, and ability and and these days it's it's really um, a high performance sport um, so the question is how how they can use that I think 
what I've learned from a coach, he says not just one way, because each and every athlete with a disability that I work with have different abilities, and I need to take my whole training session, and if speed is the outcome, speed stays the outcome. But the one that is visually impaired, I need to speak differently and explain things differently. I cannot show the, the session to them. The one that is, um, has cerebral palsy, they certain, we might not focus so much on, on fast, fast speed. You just focus on coordination, because fast speed is diff difficult for them. So you use a different method. And I think that has challenged me a lot in being more creative in, in my training sessions. Um, and to believe there's more than one way, and really, from a coaching point of view, to be creative. Um, then I was, yeah, I listened to David again this morning speak about the mind, body, spirit, and the interaction between that. And that's something that I really came to experience practically from, from from persons with disabilities is that their mind is their spirit and their belief is, is so much in that that they do things that we do not think is, is possible. So he spoke about playing this morning we had two three people at the Paralympic Games that ran personal best all th and win medals um, with grade two to grade three tests. That is physically they would send a soccer player, a rugby player, if they have a team back home, they won't play or even train for next week. They race and they did it and, and listen to him this morning. Um, the medical doctor that was with us, he actually always spoke about um, the transcendence of this person and you know, being able to do that. And I think they tap so much into their spirit and their, their mindset in order to do that. And that's something that because of that adversity they need to overcome, the way that people think about them or challenge them or they can't, they only have one hand so they need to do everything with this one hand because the other hand can't, you, you challenge your body and that is something in a practical way so I really do believe um, from a coaching point of view we need to challenge our players to actually do things rather with your left hand than your right hand and challenge them, believe them that there's way more to what you're capable of. Talent, talent identification in, in disability sport is is very difficult because you have your different classes as well. So you, what you need to understand is what what is the ability in each and every class or within each and every disability and how can you overcome that in order to make it happen. So the class that's allocated to that um, person plays a big part in their performance outcome. So our classifiers, which is normally your physiotherapists, your occupational therapists, medical doctors, and now they also start bringing your technical um, classifiers, who is in our, someone that is a coach in the field of a, post, a past athlete, they determine actually that category for that person. And within that, we know the person should be capable of doing this, this, and this. If, if they're not at that stage, you know we need to develop that. So there is attributes, like what, what Paul um, spoke about, um, but it looks slightly different within each, cl each class. So then you bring technology in. You bring someone in that's running with blades, and you need to know how the impact of that te technology is on the running performance. And it's not always just, are you physically strong? It's, do you understand the blade and do you know how the blade works and working with the predator? So there's, there's different aspects that comes with it, but it comes down to the same thing, attributes and how it actually re results in a test. Okay, the last person, um, I, I said that Suzanne was going to be the last person, but I have put right at the end to just the audio clip from uh, David Becker. Now, David's been the proto uh, mental coach. He's been, uh, which is the staff from cricket side, he's been a mental uh, coach of Pew Lewis. Um, he's spoken and taught to uh, many, many athletes around the world, um, specifically in South Africa, but also in other disciplines. And now he's talking about the mental side of the game. He's talking about uh, focusing on your end goal, on never forgetting your end goal. Um, you'll actually pick up in the, in the interview that um, I battled to get to, con to terms with it because I had a preconceived idea as to what was meant to be said. And he changed my ideas, he's changed my way of thinking, he's looking at different aspects and he kind of repeats himself to me a couple of times until I eventually uh, I get what he's trying to say. Um, and David will go through, uh, go through the, all these different aspects of, of what he's done and he gives examples of um, between the South African cricket side and Pew Lewis and what, he's, what, he, what he did and how he's dealt and how he approached him as a as different different person to somebody else, how his goals were specifically focused not on the sporting activity, on the goal of, of um, the environment of, of environment awareness, however through the sporting codes. So um, he was really fascinating and if you want to you can listen to him, it's going to be a bit of a boring clip because there's not going to be too much movement and stuff happening in it, but he is going to talk about, um, about his side of, of what he spoke at the, at the, Power, Performance, uh, the Power Performance Academy.
you know, what is mental skills and how can, how can we use that to, to improve performance. But fortunately now, I think people realize what an important asset it is. And they also have started to appreciate the link between the mind and the body and how that impacts upon performance. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about that later and actually showing you guys how that link actually works practically. Um, and hopefully sharing with you some of the skills and exercises that I use in coaching athletes around the world. So yes, very important. Um, sometimes I, I, I work with teams and they're preparing for a big physical sporting event and I ask them, you know, what, what mental preparation have you been doing for this big event? I'm working with a team now who are about to row across the Atlantic as a Talisco rowing race that gets done every year, a local team from Cape Town. And uh, they've been training for months and I said to them, well, what mental preparation have you been doing for this? You know, you're going to be rowing for 60, 70 days. And they looked at me blankly and I said, well, you need to get to work because, uh, you know, that's a, it's going to be an in, in, incredibly important tool that you're going to have to use in this physical endeavor, particularly when you're doing something of an endurance event. So, yes, absolutely critical. And uh, fortunately, people are ready to embrace that more now than they were 10 years ago. And I would have imagined the dynamic of working with an individual is one thing. Working with a team, you how many rows are there? Four, did you say? Yes. Four rows, another story. When you're working with 15-man rugby or a 23-man squad, different dynamics in play? Yes, very different dynamics. And you have to work with both, I think, in order to be really effective. Um, obviously, there is a team dynamic, and everybody has to buy into a collective vision and collective purpose. And if everybody gets their heart and mind and spirit behind a common goal, that's very, very powerful. But what I've also learned is that individuals have different triggers or anchors, and if you can find out what those are, mm. and really work with that individual and empower them in the best way possible, then you've got something really powerful as well. Mm. And last question, age-wise, because we're obviously dealing with a lot of schools here. There might be a couple of primary schools scattered around, the majority are high schools, but there are some individuals. There was a gentleman over there who's moved into now individual um, management or, or coaching of, of um, athletes at the top level. Um, where can it, is there a time where you can say, well, at t under 12s, we're not going to get into their minds, or where would your, where would you suggest that coaches begin to say there's a mental aspect here that I can tap into? I think anything around the age of 11, 12, 13, you, you really want the kids to start thinking about it. Really. If that's all, if you, if you can only get them to start thinking about it. I work with young kids as well, uh, young sports teams, and uh, I think if you can approach them in a way and you can actually give them little tools that they can use ahead of a sporting performance, simple, easy to use tools, that can have a big impact. And then already that will start to have an impact, not just on their sporting life, but on their life in general. Mm. And we've heard that trend, I must say, that we've been, as I mentioned already, to Port Elizabeth and Durban, we've had a lot of people saying that, that you can tap into sporting performances, but in so many other things, uh, David, it, it runs through your whole life, and that a lot of um, coaches are saying that when I started to evolve and improve my player as a sports person, they just became better at life skills in general, which is, I suppose, a fair comment. Yeah, absolutely, and some of the, the, the tools and resources I'm going to be sharing with you today, you're also be able to implement in your own lives to great effect, I believe. So yes, the principles are exactly the same, and, and I found that in my own life, as I started on this journey 25 years ago, I was really interested in the mind-body-spirit relationship, how that could impact on my own level of performance, not just as a sports person, but in life. And then I started to implement them, I started to get results far greater than I should have got for a person of my talent, mm. very average talent. And, um, and that intrigued me, so I started to study more and more and more, and, and, and so I began to implement it in my own life outside of sport. Okay, fascinating. Are there any questions for our panel um, from anybody in the media? Uh, any specific? We've got one question here and one question, quite a lot of questions, so let's start here. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm going to give you the mic. Here you go. All right. Uh, I think my intertwined with step forward and then with Benny as well. Are, um, in terms of how do you spot the talent? And uh, have you ever missed a talent and then you, you spot it? it? came and then you missed it and then you saw it later on. I'll give you an example of uh, Benny going to Hellenic with a barefoot and uh, <laughs> when he was young and then later on they wanted, they wanted to sign him. They, they failed to spot the talent then when he came in there with, his, with the boot. And then, of course, mental wise, at that time, perhaps Benny could have went somewhere not believing in himself. How do you work on those uh, challenges? Paul, <laughs> your answer, uh, have you ever missed any talent is no. No, no. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it, it, 
it does happen all the time, but it was interesting, you know, chatting to Alvain and, and Milton, they've, they've joined us at a couple of our camps, they're doing incredible work with their, with their boys. Um, my job is... But, uh, absolutely, I think um, being, spending that time focusing, arti clearly articulating what that end result is, crystallizing it, okay, uh, that's very powerful, and that's why it's the first step in the five keys to creating an unstoppable mindset.